Muchas gracias al señor Houston. Eh, después de escucharlo y todo lo que se ha escuchado en esta mañana y lo que vendrá, me pregunto qué hago yo con estos papeles acá en lugar de tener un dispositivo en mi mano. Pero ya vendrá para la próxima conferencia. Los desafíos de las actividades no deseadas en Internet. Patrick Falstrom. Patrick Falstrom es jefe de investigación y desarrollo en NetNot. Anteriormente, Falstrom trabajó como ingeniero destacado en Cisco, especialista técnico en Tele2, administrador de sistemas en el Royal Institute of Technology, investigador de Banjamp Information Systems y programador en la Real Armada Sueca. Ha trabajado en Unix desde 1985, con DNS desde 1987 y ha participado en la estandarización relacionada con Internet desde 1989, tanto en Suecia como a nivel global. Falstrom es uno de los editores de las normas sobre nombres de dominio internacionalizados y mapeo de numeración I-164 en DNS, creadas en el IFTF. Además, es uno de los dos directores del área de aplicaciones durante cinco años, fue luego de los cuales, luego de los cuales perdón, fue miembro del IAB, eh, equipo de arquitectura de Internet, durante tres años y miembro del directorio de ISOC en 2006 y 2009. Es asesor del Ministerio de Tecnologías de Información de Suecia desde 2003, miembro del Comité de Seguridad y Estabilidad de ICANN desde 2005 y su presidente desde el 2011. Sucediendo precisamente a Steve Crocker, quien previamente hablará en esta conferencia. Es o ha sido miembro de numerosos grupos, asesores y equipos de investigación sobre Internet y conferencista habitual sobre temas de seguridad en IPv6, entre otros temas. Adelante, señor Falstrom. Thank you very much. So um, after hearing Jeff talking about all the wonderful things that happened, I will talk about the bad things. I was uh, invited by our friends here, specifically Raul and Hartmut, to come to LACNIC. This is my first visit to, to the LACNIC meeting, and I'm really happy to be here. So thank you very much. So I was asked to talk a little bit more about the various challenges, which is to some degree underlying the various issues that we heard Jeff talk about. So why is unwanted things bad? Is it just because of business models that we heard Jeff talk about, or is it just because we'll actually, we might actually have problems with this unwanted traffic and unwanted events? One of the interesting things to think about is that when we have a packet-based network, the degradation when we actually have stress is not linear. Instead, the network accepts more and more traffic and more and more bad unwanted traffic until it collapses. And there are various reasons why it actually might collapse. For example, that people that go to web page and see that, that a storm is approaching in New York, for example, as it's happening currently, people are reloading the page if it doesn't load fast enough. So that if it is the case the network works a little bit slower than normally, people will use it even more. So backup links might be full. People might actually use the network more and more. So to some degree, what is unwanted is what destroys the network. But when talking about robustness and how, what we are going to do to make sure that the network actually works as much as we want, we should not mix up these two different problems. One is to look at how we are going to communicate after the collapse. I had this presentation a couple of times with this graph with sort of with the military and other organizations in Sweden where, where NetNode is one of them, which actually is responsible to ensure that communication in the country works even after the power grid has collapsed or after the internet doesn't, when, when the internet doesn't work anymore. And I said, there are a couple of people 
which actually are responsible to make sure that the prime minister can communicate with whoever he needs to communicate with, which is where this arrow is. And I had a couple of people in the corner in the room that, that stretched their hand and I asked, so what do you want? Yes, that it's absolutely correct. So, so you are the ones that are responsible to make sure that the prime minister always can communicate when he has the need. And they said, yes. So yes, those people do, do, do exist. But I want to concentrate on this part, which is to try to move the point, which I call when x equals z, as, as far to the right as possible. We need to build a network so that it sustains more stress than normal. So we can handle what is unwanted. So to some degree, what is unwanted, I claim, is what pushes the network to the right of the point Z. What is unwanted, it, was, it is what has impact on our ability to communicate. Of course, we have seen these kind of graphs all the time. You have something that grows according to time, and then you have people saying, Within, and they say, anything between six months and five years from where we are, things will break. And you just heard Jeff saying, within 10 years, we might not have an internet anymore. But of course, we have had this point, internet ends here between six, and six, six months and, and five years ahead of us, and I heard that the first time in 1988, and internet still works. Or whatever is internet today which of course, as Jeff explained, is not really the same thing as the internet some time ago. Here's another graph explaining what Jeff just talked about, that we are worried about what's happening. And here's where I'm coming closer to what I mean by unwanted. Remember this? This is where we had the dot-com boom. We had about 93 million devices connect to the internet. Today, we are almost 3 billion. This is an insane growth. So what is really unwanted? Well, if we're going to be able to handle unwanted events and unwanted traffic, we need to build things robust so that the normal communication, which is not unwanted, can still work. And one thing that happened Monday of last week was that the Swedish government started to use a new domain name. The Swedish government has written a digital agenda for Sweden where they very explicitly say that DNSSEC and IPv6, IPv6 must be used for all public e-services in Sweden by the end of 2013. So it's not the end of 2012, which is good for them because they just launched a new domain name which has no support for IPv6, the domain name is not signed, and it's only one NS record in the parent zone. So this shows that the IT department of the Swedish government, which takes robustness seriously, and many of you, of course, think that Sweden is one of the countries that actually is doing things the correct way. We do have some parts of Sweden that does not really do their homework very well. Of course, there are various events which actually do create problems. And these are things that we, that be able to build a network that actually can withstand, for example, these storms that we had in Sweden 1921 and 2005, or in Canada in 1998, it is just not worth it. So yes, there might be some unwanted activities that we just have to accept that they will actually cause a disturbance. But we can still, I claim, push the limit from where the unwanted, unwanted events do create disturbance has an impact. So there are a couple of problems which are pretty important when we are designing our network and our services. Do we know what will break when we get some unwanted events? Can we increase the ability for the system to actually withstand the stress from whatever is happening? And more importantly, do we know what to do when we actually do have a problem? If we already prepare, even for the unwanted or unexpected things, the more prepared we are, the better we can handle the situation and the faster we can restore after the unexpected event. And of course, can we minimize the amount of unwanted traffic? Can we build our network and redesign our services so the amount of unwanted things is not so 
large. Maybe the unwanted traffic might actually be wanted. So the question is then, what is unwanted? So my way of describing what Jeff just described is that from my perspective, we are moving into the third phase of internet. I divided my life to span with the internet in three phases, 15 years long each. Up to until 1995, we had the era of deregulation and competition. Internet arrives, regulators were created all over the world. Between 1995 and 2010, internet was something for the ICT industry itself. But after 2010 specifically, IT and ICT and the IT departments and various organizations ended up being absolutely necessary tools for the sustainability of other processes in the society, also for the non-ICT in industry. And this is a claim, we see these 15 year cycles coming over and over again. And what is at the end of 2025? I have no idea. This is an old slide from when I, when I worked at Cisco. This slide I created three years ago based on the future expectations that we could find at Cisco. And you see that video content is taking over peer-to-peer -peer in, the, in the year 2013. In Sweden, that happened three weeks ago. So it is possible to foresee a little bit in the future what's actually going to happen. One of the issues is, of course, this thing with IPv6. And the question with IPv6, where everyone is waiting for everyone else, is whether IPv6 is what is unwanted. Is, is IPv6 the unwanted thing? Or is carry grade NAT what is unwanted? Can we, by choosing carry grade NAT or IPv6, decrease the amount of unwanted traffic? Well, one thing that we absolutely know is that we don't want to be without some kind of addressing because this is clearly an unwanted situation which do have impact on our ability to communicate. And then what happened on, I think, October 4? Because of very different kind of events in, in the world, there was this rumor that the anonymous were going to, to hit Sweden. This is the biggest evening newspaper in Sweden, and it says in Swedish, today the anonymous are going to hit again and the white text under the video says, the hackers are threatening Sweden in the form of threatening Sweden as the country. Okay? What happened? I looked at our graphs at NetNode. Absolutely nothing. But look here that the, the y-axis, this is October 4, peak 400 gig, and this is a five minute average. Okay, let's see what actually happened, and then we can discuss what is unwanted. This is October 15. We have a peak here, and you see the graph go to 500 gig. There's something that happened here, and I tell you it was not anonymous. Instead, we have a look at the, one of the good material from Ripe NCC Labs, which are looking at this guy that was jumping from a balloon so let's go back again. Oops. This peak that actually was visible compared to the DDoS attack was someone doing something that people on the that consumers, you and I, thought was really, really fun. That created extra traffic that for some players absolutely was unwanted. And you see here on the graph in Ripe NCC Labs, it's a little bit you can go to the, the website to wrap and see and look at more of these pictures from the World Cup, for example, you see that the amount of traffic is so completely different than from normal Sundays. So the question is, is this unwanted? Or is it wanted? It depends on who you're talking to. Here's another thing. Mid-October, what is this? This is one of our customers, because this is actually not so visible on our graphs. One of the customers of NetNode. This was Apple releasing iOS 6, okay? Three, four, five gig extra per second over the switch. And here's another, there are other things that could be unwanted as well. Here, this was on, Sunday, on the evening of Sunday, October 21 at 20.30, uh, uh, half past 8 p.m. in Sweden. It's a little bit hard to see, but you see a dip here. 
This was about one week after Netflix and a number of other video on demand services launched in Sweden. And by the way, many of those providers actually had to upgrade once or twice that first week. This is when the most popular local TV series in Sweden, they are running between 8.30 p.m. and 9 p.m. And that TV series, at least when they launch, do not exist on Pirate Bay yet. So people turn off their video streaming and watch broadcast TV. So maybe this was unwanted, but for the online video streaming companies. So everything that is, that is no longer normal can create problems, but only if you're not prepared. And we, both Jeff and I have tons of presentations, and this goes back to Ethnos proposals and Wicket and all those kind of things. For these kind of traffic growth and differences from normal, I'm sorry, but QoS, MPLS, and all those other kind of things does not help, I'll tell you. These are much, much bigger things. So if we look at the really unwanted things, the phishing issues, here is a big change that actually now happened between April and May. Look at the difference between these two. This is from uh, 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 one of those groups that look at the various activities for viruses and how viruses are spreading, and malware. And you see that in email, there is a big change from spreading attachments with viruses to spreading links. Why? Well, I've seen from, my, from where I am watching things, we have an enormous incre enormously increasing amount of WordPress and other kind of websites that was installed around 2008 and never upgraded. And what these guys want is instead of installing a virus on the PC and laptop, where people nowadays have really, really good antivirus software, instead they want users to click on a link that go to a web server which is not patched uses a bug in the web server, and the spam is generated from the server side, no longer from the client. And the change happened between April and May this year. If we look at the malware itself, there, th these pictures, of course, are not really readable at all, but the inter what I'm tr going to try to explain here is how we are able to trace where malware is coming from. So we start to look here from the left. We look at several IP addresses from where specific email messages are sent. The email messages have similar or even with misspellings header lines that can be traced to specific attachments for Excel that is then in turn um, uh, include code for viruses that are connecting to specific command and control channels. Be able to, to chase these, malware, uh, these malwares and how they are spreading is, a, is, is something that we actually start to get to know how to do nowadays. And this picture is coming from Citizen Lab in Toronto that I've been looking at specifically the problem with human rights activists in Tibet and the various things that are. So this is from, from their report and you have the link there. It's actually pretty interesting to see how, how these things work. So from a DNS perspective that I work with, it's really important and interesting to see how it's possible to decode encrypted viruses and try to understand how they are manipulating, for example, the DNS. And one of the things they are doing, for example, is of course to register domain names. They register domain names, use the domain, newly registered domain name to spread, to, to run the command and control channel, and then they stop using the domain name again. We are working on, and I know there are a number of organizations that are working on, trying to come up with more statistics on the use of newly registered domain names for malware. That number is very, very, very high. So <clears throat> if you now move into the DNS, one of the problems that unfortunately is increasing is the amount of denial of service attacks that use the DNS. One of the largest problems with the DNS is that people have open resolvers. This is what I grabbed yesterday. There is one organization, uh, the Measurement Factory, which are scanning the net for open resolvers. And these are the number of open resolvers in, in various ASs in the world. So you see um, at least the second one, Terran Networks in Chile, is number two in the world to have open resolvers. This is not good. And why? 
There are a couple of things which are possible to do with the DNS. First of all, it is possible to send UDP packets with fake source IP addresses. So you send a packet from A with B as a source ad IP address to C, and then C will respond to B. So in this case, B is used the, the query, and the B is target for the denial of service attack. The next thing that can happen is, of course, that you might have multiple players that send packets with destination, uh, with, with the source address B, and by doing that, C will send all three packets to B. So this is not good. Another thing that can happen, specifically after you start run DNSSEC, like we have done in Sweden, is that we look at the size of the query uh, compared to the response. So in the case of, of uh, one of the domains that I'm running, the query is 39 bytes, and the response is 1,427. This is kind of an amplification. Not fun. So now, let's combine this with an open resolver. So you have a series of clients that run some malware that send packets with a spoofed source IP address to open resolvers in the world, and then we use the authoritative servers for amplification. Now, and then we have a poor target. So we send off our queries, do the amplification, and boom. This is going on at this very moment. A lot. Please have a look at your name servers and see how much traffic they are generating. There are, it's very, very easy for an authoritative server for a second or third level domain that is running in a normal hosting center to generate, which is, are the ones to the far right, to generate 100 megabits per second each of DNS. Have a look at that, because your name service should not produce so much outbound traffic. And I'm, uh, once again, I'm not talking about the root servers or the TLD servers. I'm talking about the name servers on the next level down. They are now part of these attacks. So in summary, email is still the source of much evil. But the source of the email message that I sent are no longer the, the clients. It is instead the web servers that generate the email. Open recursive resolvers is still a very big problem that we need to try to stop. It is just not fun anymore. Newly registered domain names are used more than old, and maybe this is something that we can use as some kind of mechanism to, to, to try to get some of these things under control. Of course, that might create a problem for people that, that want to register a domain name and, and use it immediately, but I would not be surprised if it's the case that we see, that we see very stiff and kind of blacklists for services on the net that are, that are built upon repudiation on the lifetime, the, the amount of time a domain name has been registered. Application via authoritative service do create problem, and, and people like myself and other DNS skilled people are looking at various different kind of ways to try to distinguish the good traffic from the bad traffic. And we'll see what's happening with that. The question is whether we can run DNS over UDP. Maybe it is the case that we should move to TCP, but the question is then, of course, what that will lead to. None of this is anything new. We know how to do this cleanup, but we actually seem to not really do the cleanup and I think one of the problems has to do with, or one of the issues, has to do with the fact that we see such a large change in the amount of clients, in the amount of devices connected, like Jeff was talking about, in the amount of traffic increase in general, in the amount of new services, and of course the fact that there are unfortunately so many players, all the players that also Jeff pointed out, that either has gone bankrupt or will go bankrupt the next couple of years, they are fighting because they don't want the change. And for them, the change that we want is for them unwanted traffic. Thank you. Le pedimos muchas gracias, señor Falstrom. Le pedimos al señor Jeff que nos acompañe también para tener un ida y vuelta en las preguntas y respuestas. Ya nos han llegado algunas. Si ustedes tienen alguna otra pregunta, simplemente levantan la mano que los asistentes y asistentes de, de sala este, les entregan un formulario y así la centralizamos en Ernesto y en Arturo. 
justamente, bueno, eh, le doy la palabra a Arturo para que nos, nos lea alguna de las preguntas a los panelistas. Ok, uh, this, uh, this is a question from Roque uh, to Joff. Uh, one failed disruption you did not mention was Second Life. Was it too far away at the, future, uh, at the time? Is social networks taking us into the same path? So the question was actually about Second Life. But I suspect that the way we interact virtually is going to continue to change. And that this mixing of what is a game and what is a meeting of real people using avatars starts to blur. Because realistically what we're seeing in games now is actually a degree of cohesion and organization. I was privileged to go to Iceland a few months ago and hear all about Eve. Eve represents 35% of the IT exports of Iceland. It's a major exporting market. Eve is an environment. They evidently have a parliament. They elect Eve politicians. They have an economy. It looks like life, except it's on starships playing galactic war. Where does this line occur when all of a sudden the real world and the virtual world blur out? And when you think about a world where those 2.3 billion people spend more than four hours a day obsessed with what's on the net, then I can only say gaming will change because games and reality are starting to blur. And it's no longer about second life, it's about life. Thank you. Gracias. Another question, this is for Patrick. Uh, what's the big, biggest challenge to the internet? Infrastructure, over control by governments, movie studios, economical gaps between uh, Europe, North America versus Africa, Latin America, security, any other? This answer is pretty simple. It's actually all of the above. I think one of the one of the problems we have is what I what one could call stress between these various forces which are fighting. I do think that, for example, the increase of traffic that we are seeing at the moment because of new over-the-top services are, for example, very good for many of the uh, of the businesses and for the consumers because the production costs for these services go down. But on the other hand, that is a problem for the parts of the world, including large parts of Sweden, which do not have the infrastructure to be able to carry the extra traffic. And then you have the business models and the legislation, and specifically the stress between local legislation and the global legislation agreements, and the difference between views between cultures, and, um, and, um, so, and um, both between cultures and between different uh, jurisdictions. So I think we have a couple of years in front of us which will be stressful and maybe, or I'm quite certain, that it is part of the, chain, the, the choice of what path we're going to choose. But I think we will see, we all, many of us in this room are working in all of these areas and we have to continue to do so for a couple of more years. Gracias. Okay, this is a, a, a question for uh, Jeff. I'll try to understand it well try to read it. What did ITU did for the internet development 10 years ago, and what ITU will do for the, for, or can do for the next 10 years, I guess? What did in the last 10 years, and what will the ITU will do the next 10 years? In, in looking at the way governments have organized themselves around international communications, it's been a history of many centuries because we actually started with the International Postal Union and figuring out how to be able to send a letter in one country and have it delivered in another but have the sender by the stamp. And then along came telegraphy and telephony and we created a new body. 
we actually created the ITU, its predecessor, out of the postal union because telephony was so different to a letter. And at the time it was necessary because in telephony, if you want to pay for a telephone call that goes across borders, the person terminating the call, that carrier, also incurs cost. And we had a complicated series of rules to make it all work. But the internet is different. Because in the internet, we've managed to create a network that is almost nothing. Everything that you and I do isn't the internet. It's all about applications and services. It's not about the underlying internet. The internet is merely a set of packet conduits, 20 bytes of IP header. What occurs above it at the application space is everything. The ITU represent the folk who do carriage at a governmental level. And the interesting thing about the regulations of 20 years ago was that they allowed for a different set of circumstances to telephony and said, look, that's not an area of regulatory oversight. Guys, knock yourself out. And we did. 20 years later, a number of countries looking back going, whoops, that didn't quite work out the way we planned. Can we regulate the internet? And they're thinking that perhaps they can regulate the tubes to alter the applications. You can't do that. You can't get there from here. And this idea that regulating carriage will somehow have some effect on content is really, really strange thinking. Like a hundred years ago, when the ITU was created because the postal system couldn't cope, my own view is it's time for us to recognize that the internet is fundamentally different. It's a different architecture. It's a different model. The services are not part of carriage. It's something else. And perhaps the best thing we could do about the ITU is to say, so long and thanks. It's been good, but we need something else. So I personally don't see much coming out of the next round of meetings. I'd prefer to see us all understand that maybe internationally we need to think about different ways to understand that this next wave of the internet is not about governments investing in communications. It's about governments making it easy for the private sector, you and I, to invest in communications in the goods, services, and products you and I buy. If we recognize that, it might be a gigantic leap forward. Thank you. Una más, tenemos tiempo. Um, I, I think this, this applies, it doesn't say to whom, but uh, I think it applies to both. Is, uh, how do you see the, 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 how do you see the war in 10 years in terms of uh, internet security? I think we will, we will see a, continue to see a race between parties that try to break in and, and, and sort of destroy, just like we see criminals on the street and the ones that are trying to prevent that. What I do hope, as I was pointing out in my presentation, is that the general quality of the products and services that we produce increases. I feel that we have seen a decrease in quality, which makes it easier for people to destroy things than the ones that protect. And I hope that we are able to turn that wheel back. But sometimes I wake up at night and I'm actually pretty pessimistic and it looks very, very bad. But I do hope that all of us, when we understand that ICT is since 2010, a, an important and necessary part of what, what el everything else that we do in life, that we actually are prepared on paying more for high quality services. Muchas gracias. Uh, ah, pardon, sorry. If I could add one more observation. Um, human beings are a remarkably complex biological organism. We are very complicated. We're so complicated that cancers and viruses exist. 
which is actually the genetic instruction that's slightly warped. And sometimes it's very difficult for the body to understand what's benign and what's hostile because it's so complicated. It's also been observed in artificial intelligence that if we ever built a true artificial intelligence engine, it'd be as lousy at maths as I am because people are lousy at maths and that's what artificial intelligence is all about. When we build extraordinarily complex computing systems, whether it's in one box or across a network, the very complexity turns upon itself. It's easy to build computer viruses. And I suspect that as we build ever more complex systems, we also create ever more complex ways of attacking them at the same time. We're never going to have the perfect computer. Security is always going to be an ongoing issue. Mm -hmm. Muchas gracias a los disertantes y por sus respuestas, el señor Houston Holstrom, muy amables.